So while we do that, um, just by show of hands, how many here is currently working on an indie game? Okay. Um, how many of you are programmers? Okay. Designers? Yeah. Hi. Um, hairdressers? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, writers? Okay. Artists? All right. Uh, producers? Sound people? All right. Woo -woo. Chica -chica um, uh, and if you raised your hand more than once, please raise it now. Yeah, that's my people. All of you. All right, that's great. Okay, so we're looking at files. So um, uh, I will give you a brief introduction of what this panel is going to be about. It's actually uh, three phenomena. It's myself, Martin Middleton, who's my co-founder, and Brad Foch, who's our sound designer. Brad and I know each other now since... 2007 or 8, so we worked together on Boom Blocks. How many of you played Boom Blocks on the Wii? Okay. <laughs> so Brad was the one that made everything sound really explody and awesome. And he also does the voices. <laughs> He's, he has an amazing ability to make sounds with his mouth, which is why he does what he does. Um, and also a very talented musician. Um, and then Martin and I met uh, actually at the ship party for Flower, I think. That's when we first met. Yeah. And, uh, and then they recruited me away from EA to go work on Journey, which was the last title that I made. How many of you have played Journey? Show of hands. All right. All right. Well, this is a great audience. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're just going to, I'm going to just blaze through these slides because um, slides aren't really that awesome anyway. Um, and uh, then we're going to talk a little bit just as a group about designing for the future. So the, the whole kind of point of the talk is I want to give you an overview of what we're doing at Phenomena and then talk to you about why we think it's important not to just be designing for the audiences of today, but for the audiences of tomorrow. So um, really, we're just going to give you an overview, and then I'll stand up here, and then we'll sort of take questions, and I'll, maybe I might like ask a few questions myself. So as I mentioned, uh, Martin and I actually worked on Journey together, and in 2012, we decided to leave Journey. Um, uh, in case you can't see us, that's me, and that's him, <laughs> standing on stage for Game of the Year, um, which Journey did really well. And afterwards, um, we were really surprised and amazed by how well it did. And normally, I would show you a Journey video, but we don't need to do that. Um, uh, basically, between 2012 and 2017, we decided that we would um, go ahead and start making some games. And so, well, what the fuck happened? Um, we have built a company that's focused on making unique, broadly accessible, beautiful games. Um, and we don't really even think of ourselves as a game company anymore. We kind of think of ourselves as a research group that does research on next generation technologies and design for new experiences. It just happens to be that we also really love video games, and so they're usually quite playful. Um, and we uh, have been really focused on using a sustainable process, which is based on shared values. And the shared values at, at Phenomena are that we believe in a diverse and developmentally organized team environment. So what that means is... Um, there's kind of this thing where you take two people to work with you, the person that you are, uh, really like fucking depressed right now and freaking out about everything, um, maybe, uh, if you're me. Um, and then there's the person who's like, oh yeah, no, I can do that, right? I'm the person that's super competent. Um, well, what if those two people were the same person? What if you didn't have to take two people to work with you every day? You just went to work the way you were and you're really honest about how you feel. So at Phenomena, for example, um, if you're feeling shitty because your partner is feeling shitty, then, uh, and then you come to me and say, shit is fucked up in my marriage or I'm having a really hard time, my kid has been sick or whatever, I just say, cool, we're going to lower your task expectations. It's going to be fine. Take the time you need to take. And when you get back to 100%, let me know. And we work together to be honest about our output as well as our inputs. So if people are spending a lot of time at work and they're working too hard, sometimes Martin or I will have to go, boop, boop, boop. I think you need to take a vacation. You're getting a little bit fried. Um, you're a little bit... And so, for example, after we do this talk, we're going to go see the eclipse. Yay for the eclipse. <laughs> Woo! And if the world doesn't end, then we'll ship our games. But that's basically what it means, being a devel developmental organization, is that we're actually really aware of the fact that Martin and I have never run a company before, so we make all kinds of mistakes. Um, you know, Brad's never been the solo sound designer at a company before, so he makes all kinds of mistakes. But the whole point is that the mistakes are part of the learning, and it's not like we have to pretend that we know what we're doing. Especially since we're indie and we're not really paying ourselves that much anyway. Might as well be honest about the fact that we're struggling, you know, and make it part of a shared experience. Um, and then the reason that we do it is because we want to make innovative experiences for emerging technologies. And so, you know, some of the stuff that we've made 
is like world. Um, how many of you know who Keita Takahashi is? He made Katamari. Yeah, okay. So um, he works at the studio and we had sort of an unexpected gap in funding. Um, and we ended up working with Google on this cool project called World. Um, and these are some little animated uh, images that show you kind of what it is. It's an, it's an augmented reality experience for the Le Lenovo Fab 2 Pro phone. I had to get good at saying that. Um, uh, it's a Tango phone. And there's gonna be a whole new wave of these kind of augmented reality camera phones coming out. And we made one of the very first applications that teaches people how to use uh, an, a phone that can show you cool things. Not just like staring at the screen, but really moving around in space and like, oh, there's something over here. Well, so, hey, Brad, if there's something way over here and I have the phone here, how do I know that it's over there? Sound could help, right? So you could have some sound. And so one of the things that happens is that Martin and Brad and other people at Phenomena are always trying to think of new ways to approach problems because a lot of times the technology is so new that we don't have design patterns for it. Um, then we're also uh, uh, sort of working on Watam with Keda, which is, um, it's a console title and a PC title, but it has some very interesting mechanics. It's physically based and it really pushes physics pretty much to the limit. We actually spent almost a whole year just working on the camera physics, um, or sorry, the, uh, the character physics for, uh, for the experience because the whole concept of the game is that people hold hands and then they climb on top of each other and then you explode them and they're happy. They don't die, they roll around and they laugh and they do funny stuff and then because they're so happy and they're making so much noise, people that have been blasted out into the universe as part of a very difficult explosion start to come home and spend time with everybody. And so what happens is, is like you explode everybody and then a giant table shows up and on the table is some sushi and a boom box and then you can, or boom box, and then you can play uh, the boom box music and the sushi and the boom box all jam out and it's like bwah, 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 and it's super awesome. So um, even on a title that's really sort of similar uh, like to a lot of other what you would call console experiences, we try to find the most difficult thing to focus on and then we use that as a way of centering the design, which is really interesting and fun. Um, and then this is like a really weird screen, um, which I'm, it, it has a movie. Uh, it's the intro for Luna and I'm not actually gonna show it because I think we should just talk. Um, but Luna is the other title that we're working on and that's a PC and VR enabled title. So essentially we started working on it with Intel actually for the real sense camera and the idea was I really wanted to work on a game where you could touch the world and at the time, that meant the camera facing me from this laptop, in fact, actually almost this exact laptop, was gonna be able to, um, to let me touch this world. And so we did a lot of design for hands touching space. And then as the technology for VR and AR started getting evolved, well, what do you know? You have hand track controllers. We just take that whole design and start to port it to VR, right? So um, a lot of the stuff that we've been doing in the studio is about taking these design patterns and applying them in ways that are really interesting and different. Um, so the thing about running a game studio, um, and I think just being a developer in general, is that it's a lot like Carcassonne in that um, you, don't, um, you don't really know what the opportunities are gonna be until they present themselves. And then um, a lot of times you just have to do the best that you can to piece together some sort of a narrative with the opportunities as they present themselves. Um, but it's very important to understand the investments that you're making. And the investments that you make are in your people. And so one of the things I wanted to emphasize with this presentation before we like sort of go to like more of a discussion is that actually the people that you invest in in your business or in your team, if you want to think about it that way, really have a huge impact on the amount of future and different that you can design for as opposed to past and same. Right? So if you're always hiring people that always understand the same history and have all the same things behind them, or you could even think underneath them because everybody's on top of the shoulders of giants, then getting forward is not going to be as easy as if you hire people from a variety of experiences and you can all stack up those experiences together just like in Watam, see how I did that, um, and make something new. So this is the team currently, and um, what I like to do is I like to show people this series of graphics. Um, if you look at us as a group, we're a lot of different shapes and sizes, but we basically four of us identify as engineers, five of us identify as artists, six of us as hybrids, and one as a producer. And then uh, eight of us identify as male, uh, six of us identify as non-white, and six of us identify as female, four of us queer, so when you look at the company, we're 70% non-cis white male. 
which is an interesting thing, right? It's not, it doesn't conform to any, I, I deliberately, like none of these things actually conform to a pattern like you would expect. They're all very strange and different. And we hire that way on purpose because we think that the best playgrounds are the ones with a lot of different types of voices and people in them. And so I think for designing for the future and thinking about the future, you actually have to think about the current makeup of your team and then try to make that team as future forward as possible as opposed to as past looking. Um, really, especially in these times when so much is going on, the only way to move forward is to process and like make different choices. And so the best way to do that with the design and with the design team is to have as diverse of a team as possible. So um, when you actually think about how to make something new, like we'll take Luna as an example because we're finaling it now, um, what we found is that if you begin looking at your game through the lens of embodiment, you can really embrace a new way of designing. And so this is a little video, and I think I can press here and it'll probably just work. Yeah, work. Play the video. Is it working? Yeah. Cool, it worked. Yeah. Technology. I'm going to do it again. Ready? One, two, three. So what's happening is, is that she's doing something and then she's looking up, right? So designing for the future, like designing for VR, isn't just what's in your face. It's what's above you, what's around you and below you, like we talked about with the Tango project, what's behind you. So really thinking about the future of design is thinking about the whole body and the whole space around a player. It's much more like designing for theater or dance or you know, a dinner party than it is necessarily like staring at a chessboard. And I think that's something that a lot of people really are starting to learn in VR. Those lessons are getting learned right now and we've been facing those pretty hardcore. And then the other one is just thinking about um, the ways in which your body movements actually feel so this is kind of like a dim sum vibe. <laughs> I'm gonna have a little bit of this, I'm gonna have a little bit of that, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. Luna has a couple of mechanics specifically where you're placing objects in a space that really make you feel like, a, almost like a little kid. So how do we figure that out, right? How do we decide to build this magical connection between your hands and this world? Well, the way that we do that is we look around. And a lot of times we look at the people in our community, which is another reason why it's really good to have a lot of different types of people on your team. This is Holly. Uh, she's the now seven-year-old daughter of our art director, or our tech artist, uh, uh, Greg Lemon. And um, she's super, super fun. And she comes by the office all the time and plays with our prototyping tools, which are actually Playmobil toys. Um, and so I think the future of games involves engaging people like Holly. Like she knows the world with the internet and the memes and touch screens and the wonder of VR from a very early age, right? Her perception of what games are is so, so packed with goodness and future forward thinking that if you're, if you're not really thinking about people like Holly, you're just really not designing for the future. I think it's really important. And the thing that I wanted to point out was is that Holly doesn't play differently than we did. She still does the same thing. She comes to the office. This is a, a, from about a five month period. So you see her hair in this picture. And then you see it here after she's been at camp. It's like real long. Um, she's been working on a story. She comes into the office and she plays with this little bear. And she says, the bear is coming. The bear is coming through the woods. And then all the animals go, no, no, the bear. And then she does this whole thing where she protects them and stuff. So her stories are really about good versus evil, protecting your friends and family from, from harm. Um, they haven't really changed. Um, but what VR and AR and mixed reality technologies allow us to do and the kinds of things that we work on phenomena is they allow us to change the pieces. They allow us to change the context, but you're still engaging that same player, right? And seeing it and being in touch with it all the time really helps. So like, here's some of the things that I do. She comes by, I take little note cards and I make notes of the stuff that she's saying. Like, beware, beware, oink, oink, oink. <laughs> and what this does is it, inf it influences all of our conversations at the office when Holly comes by. I'll notice that she's doing something. If I put the game, you know, the headset on her and she plays the game, she does the same thing. And that's how I know I'm succeeding, is that I'm reaching her at the same level as Playmobil toys. Playmobil toys are extremely well designed. They're very affordable, they're super fun, and they really unlock people's imagination. Like I've had, I've had a Playmobil like fangirl thing since college probably. They were, I was never exposed to them as a child and the minute that I saw them, I wanted to play with them. They're super great, right? If you can make a game as good as Playmobil, then you're doing a good thing. So um, 
really, you know, at this point, what I wanted to do was just get, get a little conversation started with Brad and Martin. I think they need microphones. You got them? Okay, that's good. Um, just checking, making sure everything's working. Um, and so uh, I'm going to introduce them now. So as I said, Martin is the technical director at Phenomena, and uh, Brad is the sound designer. And this is us uh, standing outside of Pine State Biscuits, which is our favorite place in Portland. Um, it's pre-eating, so we're, we're like holding the emptiness in our stomach. And post-eating, Martin had a food baby that was like this. It was amazing. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a question. Um, which of you wants the first question? Dun, dun, dun. I'll take it. All right, Brad. What is, uh, in your mind, the most interesting thing about designing sound for a virtual space? We'll leave it at that. Yeah, so probably interesting and important. Uh, I'd say maybe one of them is what we've done in Luna is think about how these sound interactions that we're using our hand and physical gesture is the, how do these feel like an instrument? Because I'm a musician, I play instruments, and a lot of the instruments that I play, like I have one called a happy drum, H-A-P-I. We brought one for the trip. Yeah, that's right. And it's just got eight little tones on it. You can't, you can't mess up. Like everything you play, you can play it lightly, hard, but all of them are, all the keys are in tone. And so everyone loves to play it. Like when I'm in an office or in the park or in my, on the beach, everyone comes up and everyone feels like a musician and adds kind of joy and like a good feeling uh, to the experience and to the environment. And it's like, okay, before we had mouse and we had an iPad and you can get a little bit of playfulness with that, but but now that we're using our natural body, like yeah. we can move our hands and like go up and down and, and look around. How can that? How can I? How can we elicit some of that joy of like playing a musical instrument and like infuse it into our game, however that is? And so that's one of the things I'm constantly doing for games at Phenomena is like, okay, how can I almost like instrumentalize uh, our experiences? So uh, yeah, so that's just one of the things that. It's completely new. Like I've been doing sound for games for over 10 years, and this is the first time I'm really getting to do that. So it's cool and exciting. And yeah. It also means that Brad has the most feature creeping ideas of anyone on the team. I would definitely true. say. <laughs> so when we have meetings, Brad's like, well, you know. And then everyone's like, because oh, we're afraid that it's going to be too good and that we're going to have to do it. And it's also going to make the schedule a lot longer. And so, but Brad really does, like when we're playing something, he'll, he's very thoughtful. And one of the reasons that I love working with you is that like, we'll be playing something and you're like, it sounds okay, but, you know, I'm really wishing that, like, there was a little bit of juice here. Like, I could put a little bit of energy into the system there. And so for Luna, actually, I think one of the things we end up doing a lot is talking about the sound as energy and the action of the player as energy that's getting put into the world, right? Um, and it's really, really hard to talk about a VR title or a PC VR title unless you've experienced it. Um, but it really is, Brad's made it so that, like, when you plant a tree, the tree goes into the ground and it pops out. And then when you grab the star and stretch it, at the top it goes... <laughs> You know, and when you squeeze it back and forth and like, it has this cool sound. When you grab the little star at the bottom and change its colors, it goes do 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 as you change the colors on the tree. So like lots of little juicy feedbacks, but specifically also thinking about the motion as we're doing it, I think is what you're saying, right? It's not just like put sound in your game, right? Yeah, like we can put cool musical sounds in anything in a in 2D game or, or point and click, but... When you play an instrument, it's it's how you move across the physical space and the sound feedback is more continuous and just like based on your one-to-one -one movement with your hand and how to make that sound good and not annoying too is a tricky part. Because if you've ever played like with a, you know, some music games are fun for a few minutes, but then it kind of gets, it can like get annoying. So that's the other balancing act. Yeah. Like making it feel fun and juicy, but but persist for an hour if you're going to play it for an hour. Yeah, we had a sound bug in the game recently where you were doing something and then there was like a low-level singing tone, like, Ooh, and it just went on like that for a very long time. And so we, would, someone would be play testing, and I'm outside the office, and Brad's like, Ugh. like he's like, just turn it off. I got to fix that. It's terrible. Yeah, and it really is like you get sensitive to that stuff. Okay, so when I think, yeah, I think go ahead. People naturally want to perform. Um, you know, even. Yeah. Even if you go see somebody who you know makes music entirely on their laptop, like they're moving their body as much as possible, <laughs> and like right. you know, you you twist the knob, you add some like some flair to it. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> like that's just I think a natural physical response, especially when you're creating music. Yeah, sound is really in inviting and stuff. Okay, so then, um, so Martin, what would you say is the like number one sort of interesting or challenging thing about designing uh, code for these environments? I think from a technical perspective, I mean, first of all, there's just optimization is much, much harder because it's sort of 
it's like, okay, we've got this running in 2D at 1080, that's all right. And then it's like, okay, we have to do that twice. <laughs> so twice, and then usually, you know, in the past 60 frames is, is all right. Now 60 frames is like, okay, you kind of feel sick. Yeah. So, okay, let's like increase that by 50%. <laughs> yeah, um, just do it better. <laughs> Um, so I think it really, like, every time, I know from a, I really like optimization, it's a fun puzzle, but I think every time the technology, like, pushes forward, and you're like, okay, now this is easy, uh, the challenge goes away, and you're like, oh, no, let's just, like, quadruple the requirements, and I'll listen <laughs> as much better. Well, and also now there's, like, a wide range of stuff available, right? Like, so it's not like we're just kind of come out for one really high-end HMD, right? Like, we're actually supporting a wide range of headsets, some of which haven't even been announced. <laughs> so how is that? Right, yeah, so there's also, um, like initially I think you sort of target early adopters, but early adopters are a very, very tiny market. They all have very similar backgrounds for the most part. Um, and if really you want, like we want to make games for everyone in the play, not just people who have very specific, really expensive high-end hardware. Um, so like, okay, how do we get this running on something that maybe isn't, doesn't even have a separate GPU, who knows? Yeah, yeah, so integrated chips and working on stuff, like a lot of the mobile devices that we work on, right, they're gonna come in extremely low compared to a lot of, op, you know, a lot of the sort of operating environments that you're used to, like even a PlayStation, you know, like a, a lower end uh, mobile device is gonna have, it's gonna have problems like putting out really good stuff. And so you have to think a lot about um, when you're designing, like as the designer, um, who is also the producer and the CEO of the company, I have to always think about like, okay, well, what am I giving these people to help them make really juicy things and specifically to meet these targets? Because if it sounds really cacophonous or it chugs um, and people are hurling, that, that that's no good. So, you know, my job as a designer is kind of making sure that the, the design requirements for the experience are clear enough without being constrained in a way that makes it impossible for Martin or Brad to do their jobs. And I think also, yeah, for... Because VR is such a physical experience, um, you know, poor performance is actually has a really terrible effect on somebody's body. Like people will fall over, they'll get sick, they'll just have, you know, I'm sure anyone who's tried VR has had a bad VR experience, and that sits you, sits with you for the whole rest of your day. You kind of just feel off and like a little woozy. Yeah, it's like eating bad food. And so when you when you're making decisions about, you know, what goes into your game, and like, okay, you know, maybe it would be great if we could have these extra lights and shadows, higher quality shadows, but like that has a direct physical um, effect on people who play your game. And it's not yeah. just like, oh, like, you know, maybe people are frustrated because the frame rate's a little bit low. It's like, no, they will fall over and throw <laughs> up. And like, is that really <laughs> something that you want to create an experience for? Oh, and we have these conversations. We just had one. We were getting ready to ship a retail build, of something like a demo. And basically he was like, nope, I took the lights out of that scene. I was like, you can't see anything. And he's like, it's because it was chugging. And I was like, no, it didn't. He's like, all right, try it. And I tried it the first time and it was fine. And then the second time I played through, it was like, oh God, that's awful. And so he's like, all right, I'm taking all the shadows out. Leave the light on, but you get no shadows. And so that's, that's the other thing about designing for the future is that there's a lot of like, the reason that I think it works at Phenomena as a deliberately developmental organization. And that's actually a phrase it's a real phrase there's a there's an actual group of people uh that there's, write in the science yeah it's science um yeah that hbr that uh that studied de deliberately developmental organizations and there's actually um a really good book called an everyone culture that you can buy that is about different ddos but at a ddo we're able to just be like yeah no sorry you, i can't do that like that's not possible robin and i'm like but that makes me frustrated and then martin's like well tough crap no, I'm kidding. Um, but, but then what we do is we dialogue and we have, a, we have a really open conversation about what's not working, which is if you try to do this stuff with a team that's really used to doing stuff a certain way or has a very specific idea of who the customer is, it's very difficult to be as flexible as you need to be. So designing for the future is an organizational challenge. It's not just something that you can just like do. You really have to be all on the same page as a team about it. So um, at this point, I think we'd just like to open up to questions. And before we do, how much time do we have left? How much should we give up? About 15 minutes. Okay, great. So, um, so please ask us some questions and be specific about who you want to answer them. Otherwise, I will answer all questions because I'm an attention hog. Questions, questions, questions. Yes, Corey, please ask a question. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, I wanted to go back to one thing you were talking about, about kind of how you structure your company mm -hmm. and you showed all those really good like hexes on like how everybody kind of aligns and all yeah. that stuff. Um, so we, we started a, a pretty new company recently. We're like a year and a half old or something like that. And right now it's just like two and a half people. Yeah. And it's like two of those people are white dudes. 
Uh, and you know, we, uh, for, for, you know, for however that is, like most of the people that we know in our network are just other white dudes. And we try to think about that a lot and like how we uh, work with more people and all that kind of stuff. So do you have any advice for like how to like really get outside of your yeah. own network and uh, be like, I guess, I guess like drill down on like how we can keep moving forward on that. Yeah, stuff. actually, I think about this a lot. So um, the way that I actually expanded my network from just being mostly white people was joining other organizations that were mostly non-white people. So just put myself in the context of like, all right, I'm going to go to like Black Girls Code event, or I'm going to go to the Blacks and Gaming event at GDC. I'm going to be hanging out with Marcus or this person or that person. And then they're going to introduce me to somebody. And like, you know, we hire people through those connections. So it's mostly for me, just as a white person of privilege, it's about like basically acknowledging that I come from that history and then being willing to put myself in environments where I'm the minority, which is a really, really good practice in general. I think it increases your empathy um, and you can do it You can do it in terms of uh, your gender normative behaviors or you can do it in terms of your politics. You can do it in terms of the, you know, the culture that you're from. I've traveled a lot as well. I've traveled all over the world and spent a lot of time in different countries with different people that don't speak the same language as me, which is really great. So just like in terms of just being a, a citizen of the world, um, it's really good to expand the context that you spend time in. It can be very awkward, but it is incredibly important to do it just as I think it's just kind of like mental weightlifting. Um, and then in terms of actually reaching out, the other thing is, is once you have allies in those communities who can help you like get over your whiteness basically, um, then you can start to expand upon what they tell you about, okay, these are the things that right now in let's say uh, your marketing materials or your website or um, the way that you talked at this talk or whatever, they can come up to you and give you real feedback and be like, that was actually not cool or that wasn't inclusive or hey, have you ever thought about this? this. And then the other thing that you can do is that you can start to give those people speaking opportunities. So, you know, right now, Phenomena looks 100% white, but at PAX, there's going to be no white people representing Watam. So, you know, that's the sort of thing where, like, when we have events, when we do things, we really try to showcase other people um, that are on the teams. And, like, as Luna gets ready to ship, one of the things that I've been talking with my PR partner and a lot of the... Um, sort of other people that we're partnering about uh, with about is that, you know, Luna's set in San Francisco um, and the art director and uh, the modeler and the animator, this is all their first game. And I really, really want them to get a lot of, you know, press time and showcase and be able to, you know, talk about the game. And, you know, their diversity profile is different than mine. Not just because uh, they're, uh, you know, a person of color or a woman or whatever, but because they actually are new. And so the other thing is, is like our networks tend to be people that we already know because we've been doing it together. And like in order to reach out, you often have to reach to people that are younger than you or people that are way older than you. And so the other thing is to not be really ageist or skillist in your hiring and to really think about hiring for development. It's much more expensive. And so the, the, the number one thing that makes diversity difficult at any business and specifically in games is that hiring younger people and hiring people who don't have as much experience is costly in terms of time and money. So the other thing you can do is you can find partners like Intel who have been super, super supportive of us. Facebook as an, and Oculus have also been super, super supportive and Microsoft now is being incredibly supportive. Um, in when you hire, you say, this is the run rate for my company. Like right now, Phenomena charges uh, 12K per person per month on any contract that we do, um, but we're bumping it to 15 because rent rates are going up and people's livelihoods are getting more expensive, mostly because we provide healthcare. And so when I make a pitch to a publisher, Thanks, yeah, <laughs> it's right. It's true. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, we, we end up, we end up saying, Hey, this is the rate we charge. And this is why diversity and inclusion don't come at no cost. They come at a cost. And the cost is you have to pay me to support people who aren't getting the schooling or the opportunities they should be getting because of white supremacy. And if you do that, then you can actually spread some of that goodness around to the people in that community. And then the other thing I always say, and this is really true, is that we think of phenomena as a process. The reason it has the loops and the reason it's called phenomena is because we want it to be a process for us to learn and grow. We don't expect anyone to stay at the company for more than five years. Like when our games ship in the cycle, a bunch of people will go off and do new things. And that's actually okay. After Journey, Martin and I left the TGC team and started phenomena because we wanted to try something new. We actually really encourage people to constantly be thinking about what else they can do, how they can be volunteering, other games they can be making, which is incredibly helpful for diversity because it turns out a lot of people just want to get some skills and then they want to level up. So um, I'll stop talking. I would, well, I would say in addition to that, it's, I mean, hiring is super hard in general, hiring good people. Yes. And especially for a small team and everyone's busy, you don't have somebody who's in charge of recruiting specifically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Martin and I are the recruiters. So it's very, 
like it's hard enough to, to even take the easy path with hiring. It's like, oh, like my friend's friends like did this game and like I know they're good and et cetera, let's just talk to them. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who don't make games, not necessarily because they're not good, they wouldn't be good at making games or they wouldn't enjoy making games, but because they don't feel like they belong uh, in that community. Yeah. And I think, I think if you take the time to spend the extra effort into, okay, how do I evaluate this person? Not based on, oh, like, you know, what are, what are the games you made? Um, figuring out deeper down, like, all right, what are you capable of? Uh, first of all, like, would you enjoy making games? And are you yeah. capable of learning how to um, develop these skills? Yeah, it's like, what are you capable of becoming is a really interesting question to ask someone. And when we hire, I often say, all right, so let's say it's five years from now and you've shipped a couple games or maybe just one because games take fucking forever. Um, you know, what do you want to do? Like, where do you see yourself in five years, 10 years? Um, Martin and I both see a coach who's really helpful and she's always telling us to think about not this year, not next year, but five years from now, 10 years from now. When we started the company, we wrote down a manifesto for like how we wanted the company to be. It was basically guidelines about goals that we want to achieve with the business and um you know, it's not the secret. It's not like just money magically appeared, but because we had a plan and we really did have a mission, when we talked to partners, they were like, oh, that sounds actually kind of in line with our goals. Like, let's see if we can work it out. Like, yeah, you know, we can't do a $50 million game with you, but we could totally do a $3 million game with you. And like that kind of process comes from thinking through these questions ahead of time. And I, yeah, asking what phenomena could become is I think kind of what we did. So other questions? Yay, Sienna. Hi. Hey, how's it going? It's going good. Nice to see you. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever told you this in person. Oh, but, gosh, no. Um, Is my fly open? No. <laughs> not not today. Um, but you're like one of my favorite speakers because you have that sort of like totally unfiltered, yeah, honest. That's true direct, you know, matter which I think is like missing a lot. I need the no filter hat. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Um, which made me like really interested in that, um, the thing you're talking about, the deliberately developmental organizations. Yeah. Like, it's really interesting. I've never heard of that, but it kind of matches like how I try to approach myself in professional situations more or less. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just kind of curious if there's a certain point where like you have this office and it's got like all these creatives and you're like, you know, you had to figure out all these things together. Do you ever feel like you have to dial back the emotion or honesty or put up a filter about things yes. at times? Yes. Well, so, and this is actually, I think that one of the keys of deliberately developmental organizations is not that you come to work and you bleed out all of your problems on everybody. That is inappropriate. Don't even do that to your friends. Yeah. Don't even do that to your friends. Seriously. <laughs> oh, like, dear. like Ke Kelly and I have been talking about this. We're working on the little thing. And one of the things we're working on is a conversation about the emotional labor conversations that we have had with a lot of developers over the years and um, with, with each other as well. Um, and the number one conversation I have with people, both inside of Phenomena and outside of it at events, is get a therapist. Like, seriously, you are processing something really too intense with me right now, and I am way, 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 way below that pay grade. Like, I just can't, I can't tell you how to end your marriage, or I can't tell you how to shutter this company, or how to, like, get this person to give you $3 million. Don't ask me. I don't know. Like, I can't, I mean, that was so much, that's so much intensity, right? So one of the things that we do is we try to let people acknowledge their feelings at the office, but if their feelings are leaking out and getting inappropriate with other people, we, we take some time and we say, okay, is this a nonviolent communication? that you're having with these people? Are you using non-judging language or are you using judging language, evaluative language that makes them feel uncomfortable? Or I've noticed that you keep bringing this up at lunch. It's kind of a personal topic. It seems like it's not going well at home. Maybe you should have a conversation with someone about taking some time for yourself. Do you need to dial back your commitments and responsibilities in order to meet the responsibilities that you're making? These are not easy conversations to have, but if you don't have them, what's, what ends up happening is resentment right? And everybody's worked on a team with somebody who is really going through something emotional or fucked up and then they, they can't meet their commitments and then everyone feels let down by them and then they judge them and they get angry because that's how we're taught to behave. And so a lot of what we do at Phenomena is acknowledge that, I mean, even I, I have definitely leaked out my problems on the rest of the team. Like if I'm stressed out about money or like worried that we're not going to be able to hit a deadline or whatever, sometimes I get really grouchy. Martin and I talk about this all the time. When he's task swapping a lot, if you go up to him at the computer, he goes, yeah, Yes. <laughs> and he knows that he does it. And so now when we have really, you know, big deadlines coming up, he'll, he'll take the time to set aside a person who hasn't worked with him through a deadline and say, this is how I behave when I'm stressed. Please, if you have a request, 
wait until I'm free, or if I snap at you, just know that it's not you, it's me, right? And it's not like we're perfect, right? I mean, I have all kinds of problems. Brad is actually perfect. I used to say, Brad is, Brad, is, Brad is the chillest person I've ever worked with because he lives in Venice and he like constantly surfs and does acro yoga. Helps, so sure. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but in, I just, his mom's like a therapist and she's just like so well balanced. Like, I just want to be Brad basically. Um, but the rest of us have issues. Um, that we need to work with. Um, and so, yeah, you just, you definitely have to sort of have boundaries. And this is the other thing. Yeah, boundaries are super important. Yeah, I mean, you go to GDC and like people are like, oh my God, my game sucks. And like, I broke up with my partner and also I'm ugly. And you're just like, no, no, let's, let's have a drink or maybe let's just sit here with some water and like relax for a minute. Like, how are you? Like, stop the judging, stop the freak out. Like, let's just have a moment. And that's a way of setting a boundary. In addition to, um, to Kelly's talk, um, stay hydrated at these events because yes. that's super important. <laughs> it is. And you get freaked out. You get freaked out when you don't drink water. Of course, I hate water, so I can only drink it if it has bubbles in it. So I call it La Croix. But uh, <laughs> other, other questions? Uh-huh. Uh, okay. Here? Yeah. Yeah. Here in the front. Here. You get a microphone. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I had like a design question, I guess. It's like, uh, I mean, you guys have made a career on being sort of, uh, you know, stepping outside of the box and using mechanics especially that um, I, I feel like just when I talk to either indie developers or, you know, when I talk to my friends who don't play games yeah. and I'm like, why don't you? How can I get you into it? One of the main things they say is there's just like a certain mechanics that they, they're like um, waiting for or thinking that's going to happen. So they're like waiting for it to be a shooter or like a platformer. And I guess I was hoping maybe if you could like speak to a bit of like your process of de deciding like how is a mechanic different, but also mm. like how does it, how it can, you know, serve a purpose other than just being different just to be like different. Unless that's a thing, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I, think that, I think that's a really good question actually. Um, and Brad is a good person uh, to sort of help me answer it. I think when, um, so in Luna, there's a, there's a concept of like a scrambled puzzle. It's like a sort of like a tangle um, of star lines, almost like if your necklace comes out of a bag after a trip and it's all messed up and you gotta like, or like yarn or whatever, you gotta untangle it. And, um, when we first started working on it, uh, Brad had a bunch of ideas about how we could interact with it, right? So talk a little bit about those those concepts that you had, you know? Yeah, I mean, in this particular case, it's talking back to the instrument idea. So maybe this could be a star harp, you know, space star harp. You know, and between the points, you'll play it, and, you know, will, will it feel good to move your hands in this way, or will it be complicated, or will it have too much craziness? And, like, why would we want to put that feeling into the game, too? Is it an arbitrary sort of playing a space harp, that's cool, it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe the feeling of untangling a thing, like vis visually and physically, maybe helps reinforce the concept of the tangled inside that you're kind of straightening out. Yeah. But that's, you know, hopefully on some level we maybe feel that, maybe we don't super consciously articulate it in our mind. But. And so then when we started talking about the star harp idea, Brad did some prototypes, and we put the prototypes in the game, and then... Uh, other things came up that were way more important and we stopped working on it and then we didn't really revisit the gameplay until basically like last month. Like we just were like, okay, that part of the game, it works, people get it. But I swear to God, every single time someone solves one of the puzzles, the first thing they do is this. They like put their hands inside of it. They expect there to be sound feedback and there hasn't been any for a super long time. And every time it happens, I think, oh, when are we, we going to get the Space Harp done? And so probably um, when we go back, actually after the eclipse, Space Harp is probably going to, like we're going to do some kind of Space Harp thing. Now, is it going to end up being space harp? Maybe not. Like, one of the things I've been thinking is, like, you take a star, you put it in the right place, and if it has stars after it that are in the right place, it goes bing, 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 and then it stops if there's, like, a place that's broken. And so you can then put that one in, and it goes ding, 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 and stops at the next one. And when you put the last star in place, then it makes all these pretty sounds, right? And so Austin and Brad, Austin Wintry, who did the score for Journey, is doing the score for Luna. There are conversations right now are actually about, okay, well, what would those notes be? Where do they come from? Are they singing notes from our, one of our vocalists that represent one of the animals? Or are they tones? And we, we have like what, melodic phrase, singing voices, and then we have names. So like the owl, when the owl sings to the moon, the owl is singing the name of the moon. That's the way we talk about it on the team. Now, yeah, I know. That sounds really crazy, but um, but that's how you do it. Like, so we really let ourselves be that weird, like with each other all the time. Um, and I think if we, when we constrain ourselves, actually, 
at the beginning of the process, the language is always really gross, and like we don't know, like star harp became a thing when we started talking about it with Brad, right? And like, so then every once in a while, somebody's like, oh yeah, star harp, you know? And then like, yeah, just like flag that, remember that we want to do star harp later. But then weeks, months, years go by, someone joins the team and they're like, you know, there's like no feedback in here and we're all like, star harp, you know? <laughs> so it's a process, you know? Um, and not all the ideas that Brad has can actually make it in the game. Um, again, Brad is really, he's the, he's the star of Phenomena. He makes everything possible. But um, all good ideas come from Brad in some form. But um, I think that yeah, in we, the long we run. we all just watch Brad work. Though, yeah, we just, we're just waiting for, Ed, for Brad to <laughs> make, make everything great. But, um, but we try to get in the ones that make sense. And so that's the other thing is just editing, you know? Like the process of thinking of the game, honestly, it feels really awful. Like, I, I posted a video of Luna recently, which is of you being able to see all the terrariums in the UI, which is something that I drew in my notebook like five years ago. And like, when I actually saw it, I actually started crying. I was like, oh my God, like, I can't believe it's really happening. It's been so long since I drew this stupid little bird in my notebook and like talked to Richard LaMartian about how I wanted to make a game called Libby. You know, it was like years and years and years ago. And so it feels like just climbing through molasses and like, it's fucking expensive and people quit and then people have babies and you're like I love your baby but I don't want you to go and like you know and you're just like and then like years later you're like oh my god we've had like five phenomena babies and like the game is almost barely done right um but it's worth it you know and you know I mean I really think that um, the, the whole point of this, the stuff that we do when we're talking with developers, is to encourage you to take the time to be a little weirder, to be a little bit more inclusive, and to be, to be comfortable with that process of unknowing, because that's really what making games is about. It's about not knowing. Otherwise, you're just making something that was already made, you know? And if you really want to do that, you know, that's fine. But for us, we really, like, try to push it a little bit and, like, say, okay, art is stuff that hasn't been made yet, you know? I would say that's one of my favorite things about working at Phenomena is you know, Robin, Martin, and Kata, they all really push me. Like, I love the outer boundaries. They're like, okay, that's outer, but can you go even more outer? And it's like, yes. Yeah. Kata's favorite question is, why? <laughs> why is it like that? Why don't we do something else? Which is really good. Um, all right, one more question, and then we're going to wrap. What was the decision-making process like for you to become the three roles that you are? And... What is it like to juggle a uh, producer, CEO, and designer? Well, so Martin and I talk about this all the time. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Like, how do we decide what we do? Yeah, it's not so much a decision as, like, there's, you hire people, it's like, oh, this person's good for this thing, this person's good for this thing. Um, then there's everything else, and somebody has to do it. <laughs> it really yeah it's really true and so we were just talking about this on our next project like martin was like i really want there to be a programmer lead so we're actually we're hiring we're hiring for two leads right now two programmer leads we also need an animator really badly um but um we really want to hire leads for all the projects so that martin doesn't have to be the lead he's the lead on luna and he's a tech director for the company which means if anything breaks on any project or anyone's computer martin's dealing with it which is like late nights it it person well. it person um yeah it's glorified tech director is kind of glorified it right now which is shouldn't be. Um, but we're like, we're really strapped. I mean, like if you looked at a PL for Phenomena, it costs us $1.8 million a year to run the company, basically. Um, we charge this very specific monthly rate. 20% uh, of that goes to, you know, healthcare costs and the rest just goes to developers. Like 99% of our money that comes into the company just goes right back out to the people. Like, we have no money. We're, we're currently looking at a new office space in San Francisco, and like, we pay 3,800 bucks a month for our office. And the next office that we take is likely gonna cost us between 15 and $22,000 a month, right? So like, we have made some really, really good decisions about saving money, but you just can't do it at some point. Yeah, San Francisco, maybe not a great decision. Yeah, I mean, but the thing is, is we love San Francisco. We made a game about San Francisco. We love living there. We love the people there. Like, you know, it's like super gay and awesome and like really beautiful. And like, I, whenever I go to San Francisco, I feel like I'm home. I refuse to be pushed out of the city by a lot of tech bros that want to make like, you know, a juicer that you could just like push a bag and make juice with. You know what I mean? Like that's... <laughs> Come on, that's not cool. That's so not cool, right? Like, San Francisco has to stay weird, and we have to have artists in it. Otherwise, it'll just not be weird anymore. It'll be like, I don't know, Cleveland. I don't know. Maybe Cleveland's really weird. I, I, I don't mean to diss on Cleveland. I love you, Cleveland. No, seriously. But, like, this is a, this is a thing, right? Like, if you looked at the, the money that Phenomena makes, we've never sold a game for profit. We just always, we're always taking small grants and working with our partners, you know, by hook or by crook. Like, Luna's going to have had, like, four major people 
the, that were really responsible at their organizations for making it happen. Um, and if it weren't for those people, we would be dead in the water. And we definitely almost did die. I mean, we had a project canceled. We had to like lay a bunch of people off and then come back from it. Um, so you know, the other thing is that it looks like we know what we're doing, but we totally fucking don't. And um, and I think the way that we decide things is we just get up every day. Martin said something to me the other day that was really inspiring. He said, "I'm gonna get up every day and I'm gonna pretend like this is my first day at Phenomena. I'm just gonna approach it like." well, something's going to happen. What will it be, right? Rather than thinking about, well, it's going to be awesome or, oh, it's going to be terrible or I'm never going to finish all the tasks on my list. And then, you know, when we don't get something done, we say like, you know what? I was just too tired. I couldn't get it done. Sorry. You know, I, I totally meant to call the exterminator about the mice problem, but I was so exhausted from the pitch deck that I wrote that I didn't do it. So please clean the traps, I'll call the guy today. You know, it's not glamorous being the boss, but um, I think in the long run, the best thing that we learned this first five years is that we can do everything, but we don't want to. And, you know, from now on, when we take projects and when we work on stuff, we do it in a way that we can hire all the people that we need and not feel guilty about not doing one thing or the other all the time. Cause that's just a shitty way to feel. When I think just because you're confident in uh, performing a certain role, um, if you're also performing for other roles, you're not really going to be that great at any of those. Yeah. And so if you're, if you think about um, the project from like, okay, let's say I'm somebody who is just responsible for um, delegating things and deciding who is in which role, I'm not actually on the project. It's like, all right, do I want this person who can only, uh, you know, at attribute like 30% of their time to this role when it actually needs a full-time person? Yeah. Um, even if that person's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So my dream for Phenomena is that um, that we have a 3-4 building. The first floor is a public space where we can do events and game jams and stuff with local kids. The second floor is the development space where we do projects. And the third floor is kind of like where we have all of our meetings and like uh, do like a big picture creative and that we work on a series of small small uh, and medium-sized uh, stuff with young people, people that are graduating. Uh, I teach in Santa Cruz. I'm a professor at Santa Cruz. I run an undergrad program and also a master's program there because I don't have enough to do. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I started teaching in Santa Cruz because I wanted to give back a lot more in terms of diversity. Like most of my students are, are actually, like a majority of them are women and women of color. And I really feel this is very important for developing the industry moving forward. So um, we really, I really want the company to grow into a thing that's more of a process and not just a process that I'm pushing all the time, but that it's kind of rolling on its own, you know, and not, hopefully not rolling downhill. <laughs> and that's, that's how you gain the most momentum, though. That's well. <laughs> downhill and then up a big launching thing and then off into the stratosphere, into the eclipse, into a lake. That's right. Um, and so, yeah. So I think with that, I'm, we should probably uh, end it. But thank you for your time. We really appreciate you listening. <laughs>